a real pleasure to welcome you to our person-centered complex care theme meeting. Uh, my name is Tony Marson and I'm the uh, theme lead. And um, at, at our previous art fest, we've, we've uh, spent some time trying to identify really some, some bottom up uh, priorities. And uh, we've identified uh, continuity of care, uh, digital health care and, and multimorbidity as, as main themes. And with there's some uh, work going on in the background, uh, ensuring that the, the partners um, want to prioritize those areas. And, and we've got some systematic reviews uh, evolving. So all that work is continuing to go on in the background. And we decided at this, uh, at this art fest, we'd have a, a different flavor. And uh, uh, we're, uh, we're going to start off by uh, introducing uh, Alan and Steph. And I've just realized that there are a couple of slides uh, that we prepared for this. And I've no idea whether they're being shared at the moment because uh, I'm not in charge of, of sharing. So I'm, I'm just going to continue talking in the hope that uh, either you can see them or they're going to appear at, uh, at, at some point. So, 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 so yes, Tony. Okay, so I'll. Uh, I think the IT guys are, are sorting all this, uh, sorting all this out. Hopefully, but but it's, it's a pleasure that uh, Alan and, and Steph are going to introduce themselves as our uh, as our uh, uh, um, uh, public advisor co-leads, uh, keeping us on the straight and narrow, trying to help ensure that our projects are relevant uh, to, to the public, and, and we've got public grafted into uh, into projects. And, and then we're going to have a, a series of, uh, of videos which, which are going to highlight uh, projects that, that are being run through or, or, a bit, or are uh, affiliated uh, with the theme. Uh, and, and this should hopefully be, a, be a, a great opportunity for you to see how, how projects uh, evolve from, from idea through to pulling a team together, through to getting a, a grant application, through to uh, getting a project up and, up and running. So we're going to, uh, we're going to have a, a uh, presentation on the co-create atrial fibrillation project from Sean Rourke. We can have a, a, a discussion around the complex regional pain syndrome project uh, that uh, Selena Johnson and the team are running. We're going to hear about a, a randomized controlled trial in, in uh, uh, patients with chronic uh, angina uh, from Nefin Williams. We're going to hear from Adam Noble about building a project focused on acute care. And then Lauren Walker is going to tell us uh, something about the uh, multimorbidity uh, that framework that we're uh, trying to pull together. And if time allows, uh, we'll have a few minutes for discussion, um, which we'll probably need to focus on using the chat function in, uh, in, in Zoom or, or in the online platform to try and keep that uh, uh, manageable. It's always quite a challenge to have uh, 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 have a have a discussion with uh, uh, over Zoom. But let's uh, with this number of people. But let's see how it goes. So, are we ready for our first couple of presentations from Alan and Steph? Who's got the play button? Hi, Alan and Steph. Welcome to the theme. Really great to have you on board. Uh, Alan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background and, and what you've done before? Certainly. Um, well, I'm, I'm a public advisor. I've uh, been one now for about three years. Started with Clark uh, on a project uh, evaluation, GP, evaluation of GP forward view. Uh, which was really quite interesting uh, because for, if for no other reason I got to uh, in, an introduction to things like primary care networks and so on which um, I'd never heard of before to be perfectly honest. Um, I live in St Helens, um, I'm a retired civil engineer, um, used to work for Nosy Council. Um, for a lot of the time I was there I worked on urban regeneration, objective one, single regeneration budget, all that sort of stuff. Very much about um, physical and economic regeneration of, of Nosley. Um, I have a son, uh, he's 37 going on six. Um, 
Steph will know what that means, <laughs> I think. Um, he, he has a severe learning disability, autism, epilepsy, um, or a few other things, diabetes, um, and, and so on. And it's because of him and that I have become particularly interested in things like person-centered care. Uh, I, I used to be a trustee of Royal Maincap, National Maincap. Um, I used to be chair of Liverpool Maincap. Uh, I'm still chair of St. Helens Maincap, but it's a very, very small little organization. Um, but whilst with my involvement with Maincap, I became, as I say, very interested in, in um, person-centered um, support and so on. And, and um, it's very big if you like, it's considered to be very important in the learning disability area, and it's right to be. Um, recently, I've become involved with uh, People Pathways Associates, who people might know of it. It's um, um, uh, a community interest country. I'm vice chair of that company, rather, um, that um, is based in the Northwest. And through that, I've got involved with transforming care for people with learning disability and or autism, which is a thing uh, where trying to reduce the number of people who are uh, looked after in hospitals, long stay hospitals, many of them, for no reason other than they've got a learning disability and or autism. And that the idea is to um, get them out of there and, and, and get them looked after or, or cared for in the community. Uh, also, of course, to stop people, more people being admitted. And so far, it's been really quite successful, apart from possibly the, um, the forensic side of it, the, the side where people uh, wind up in a secure hospital, such as those in the Gulf, um, because of um, uh, having committed some sort of crime, even though they probably didn't know they committed the crime. Um, so I've been not very much in that. Um, with are another thing that I'm really interested in is health inequalities or health equity, to put it and to turn it the other way up. Um, so I've been involved in the HI subgroup since it was set up with Anna and Paula and others. Um, and through that, I then got involved in, um, uh, at least I think it was through that. So anyway, the, the Liverpool BRC, bio, Chemical Research Centre. It's a big at the moment for, for money, um, but that's uh, plodding along in the background. And also, very recently, the you have to forgive me if I get this wrong. Hello, is it, is it the School for Public Health Research, which is based up at Lancaster University, and they have got very interested in the um, the HIAT, you know, the, the tools for health inequalities and also the hands and so on. And they, they want to get that more embedded in, in what they do. So that's really quite interesting. So that's about me. Um, hope I haven't taken up too much time with that. No, at all, not at all. Very interesting, Alan. Uh, Steph, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, my name's Steph. I've been a public advisor for seven years, uh, originally with Clark, now with ARC. Um, and I took part in the current, the Neighbourhood Resilience Programme, um, as a resident advisor at the time under Clark, under, uh, yeah, under Clark. And then we did a piece of work with, we chose to use a graphic artist to produce a booklet. So we did, we interviewed, we had several community conversations and we, in, we identified pockets of our community. Uh, I live in Knowsley. Um, which were very under supported, those with social isolation. So we, we interviewed up to 12 people within our community from all walks of life. And we produced a booklet because we wanted the booklet to be able to be read by everybody and pictures, you don't really need language. So we wanted this uh, booklet to be in doctor surgeries and we wanted it to be in uh, libraries and community hubs. So then that was very successful. We won a, an HIR award with that. 
And then our second booklet was Hidden Struggles with Drugs and Alcohol. So we interviewed people who were in recovery in houses of abstinence. We interviewed frontline uh, outreach workers. We interviewed uh, companies that deal specifically in drug and alcohol uh, abuse and recovery. And we interviewed a, a wide variety of people who were struggling with addiction. And uh, some of them were your middle of the road housewife who kept the bottle of gin in the washing machine because she was the only one who, who used a washing machine. And a Friday night drink became a Saturday night drink, became a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So she was a functioning alcoholic. Um, we took this series of booklets on a massive road show to council chambers, to local CCGs, to local safeguarding teams. And it was very, very highly, highly, um, so it was very, very, very popular with people and especially people who work in safeguarding teams because they, their role is office based. So for us to be able to go and tell them what's going on in their community with the community they support, they were absolutely gobsmacked. So us as a community, it gave us very strong links to take that booklet on a journey. So we produce, we, we took it on a journey to the Blue Cone Chambers in Liverpool where the North wide, North West wide coast safeguarding event and we told our story there and it showed our because we produced the booklet but we also produced poster size pictures of the whole story so they could go on this road show um and then obviously the the project finished the neighborhood resilience project so we we still produce, produced a third booklet which was the lgbq community um, and we're still waiting through fund and running out. We're still waiting to get a poster size uh, display so we can take that on a bit of a roadshow. Um, I'm 20, uh, 20. I wish I was 20. I have a son who's 20. He has autism. He's visually impaired, epilepsy, but he's got a rare genetic condition, which is genetically passed down from my father. So it goes from father to daughter to son. Uh, it's no cure. So we we deal with day-to-day -day life as we need to deal with day-to-day -day life. Um, I agree with Alan, person-centered approach is very important to me because it's it's an approach for the person themselves and it's person-centered for them. Um, I have strong connections with the CCG in Nosley and have worked with them on interview strategies for interviewing staff and employing staff. Um, I'm connected with uh, contact a family and I'm also connected with our local parent care forum in Nosley. Um, I'm a community activist and a volunteer for the last 17 years and as a full-time carer um, I just like to put me, me I keep, like to be active and busy so um, I volunteer in community pantry, food bank and I have my own community group which I feel is a place for the community Everybody should have a place in their own community. Um, with ARC, I'm in the Public Advisor Strategy Group, the Forum, and I've been doing pockets of piece of work for other aspects of ARC. If there's uh, Public Advisors options to be able to go in it, I'm very, very strong on social prescribing within the community. I think social prescribing goes on in the community and community volunteers do it. The only link that we haven't got is the GP, GP link. I've attended a couple of workshops um, with other providers from the Walton Centre and who've done social prescribing aspects before patients go home for long term for forever care. It's about giving families the option to make sure everything's in place before the person who's leaving hospital is there. Housing, care, social activities and things like that. Uh, Nosley is a very underprived borough, um, so I think I'm really, really strongly passionate about social prescribing and health inequalities. The um, we haven't got a health a good health rate in Nosley, especially cardiovascular health um, is very poor, and I feel very passionate with our because it gives public advice, especially on a theme like the PCC theme that I know inside out in the respect of the journey I've gone along with my son and 
I think being a parent of a, a, an adult with disabilities, nothing lands in your lap. You have to go and seek it. So public, public, public research and health inequalities, I'm really passionate about. I think if we can work side by side with academics to bring research to the forefront with the public involvement is really impassionate for me. To wind down as a person, I love to read. That's me. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sean Rourke and the title of my PhD is the Co-Create AF Project. To begin with, the aim is to co-create and evaluate the feasibility of an AF rehabilitation intervention. Year one begin with a retrospective cohort study. And this will investigate exercise-based cardiac rehab for patients with AF. Study two is a systematic review, and this will focus on the effect of exercise intensity on cardiovascular health and AF outcomes. Year two and study three is the co-creation and healthy phase, and this will be used to develop our physical activity intervention. It's a mixed method study, and it will utilize workshops, focus groups, and interviews and it will involve multidisciplinary stakeholders. Year three is a randomised control trial, and this will be used to evaluate the feasibility of the co-created physical activity invention embedded with AF care compared to usual care. Why I feel my benefit from the ARC, first of all, is the different training avenues that will develop my skills as a researcher, networking with different PhD students and academics, and finally, impact. So with the emphasis on creating research that can be implemented in the existing infrastructure, I feel this is really key for my project. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good day. Hi, I would like to thank um, ARC for inviting me to speak about our experience working with ARC Northwest on our project and having the opportunity to present um, this project to everybody here today. So who am I? Well, my name's Selena Johnson and I work as a chronic pain specialist physio at the Walton Centre in Liverpool. The Walton Centre is a large tertiary pain service, so we receive referrals from both primary and secondary care within our catchment area. And our catchment area includes Merseyside, Cheshire, Lancaster, Greater Manchester, parts of the North Wales and also the Isle of Man. Within the pain service, we have a large pain management programme and a dedicated CRPS service. And I am the physio lead for the pain service and also the research lead for the pain management programme. I've got a special interest in complex regional pain syndrome and I'm passionate about trying to promote what we can do to support patients that are living with this condition and particularly seeing the long term impact that this condition can have. I'm also in the early stages of my research career and I've recently taken up a clinical research fellowship at the University of Liverpool. Um, Prior to this as well, I'd also recently completed um, a research for patient benefit research grant and I'm in the final year of my PhD. So I'm eager to advance my research skills and experience that will facilitate research that's going to help pay the patients I treat. I've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work with various um, on various um, complex regional pain projects and work with the people on this slide. So I just want to explain who these people are on the slide, um, as this is how our project really started and took shape. The gentleman on the left of the slide is Dr. Andreas Gobel. He is a pain consultant at the Walton Centre um, and an expert in complex regional pain syndrome. In addition to the research work um, he has done in this area, he is also the principal author of the UK CRPS guidelines and part of the European Pain Federation CRPS task force. He's developed our pain serv um, CRPS service sorry, at the Walton Centre and I've been involved in the physio aspects of this. And these three ladies in the photo are me in the middle and Fiona Cowell to my left and Sharon Gillespie to my right. Sharon and Fiona are orthopaedic specialist physios who work at another hospital in Liverpool, the Royal, um, and they have done a lot of work on early intervention for CRPS, which um, I will come on to. And all four of us have worked together on numerous presentations for CRPS at various conferences. And we've also developed the CRPS Assist app, which is a, an app to support um, therapists with the treatment and management of CRPS. 
So we all work on this condition, but what is complex regional pain syndrome? Well, it's a, a debilitating, painful condition that usually affects a limb and is associated with sensory, vasomotor, um, pseudomotor and motor abnormalities. And it usually occurs, as, uh, occurs after an injury to the limb. So what do we mean by sensory problems? Well, we mean things like allodynia, which is where the limb is really oversensitive to light touch or temperature sensation, um, and um, more painful um, to, to um, pinprick compared to maybe the other side. Vasomotor changes I mean, mean changes in temperature and colour, so the limb can become very hot compared to the other limb or very cold or both, and it can go various colours from being quite mottled and purpley to bright red um, in discoloration. And you can just about see that on the picture there, one hand being slightly redder than the other. It also causes pseudomotor changes with there being pronounced swelling or edema and also the, the, the hand or the foot can sweat more profusely than the other, the other limb or um, it can be asymmetrical. Motor problems are also a big feature of this condition and patients frequently have problems in terms of range of movement, initiating movement or weakness and tremor, as well as sometimes having um, th skin or hair growth problems with the nails being thicker or they'll grow extra hair in the area of the CRPS. So CRPS, as it sounds, is an unpleasant condition for patients and it causes a significant therapeutic and financial burden, not only to the individuals living with it, but also to the NHS. Health related quality of life for those living with long term CRPS has been found to be lower in comparison to other long term conditions um, with known poor quality of life, such as diabetes and chronic lung disease. And it's also been shown that the number of work days has been found to be 20 times higher in um, lost work days has been found to be 20 times higher in patients with CRPS than in patients without, with two thirds of all CRPS cases developing work, long term working capacity for more than 90 days. National CRPS guidelines as well as national orthopaedic guidelines suggest CRPS should be identified and treated early and that there should be agreed pathways of care. And the most pro common predisposing injury associated with CRPS is um, distal radius fracture with up to as many as up to 25 cases developing, 25% um, of cases developing CRPS. So Fiona and um, Sharon work in fracture clinics um, and they've noticed that the promotion of early movement of function for people who show signs of CRPS follow a fracture seem to really help reduce some of these horrible symptoms, which is also supported by the literature. And as physio leads within their department, they felt that their physio teams were really well placed to influence um, early CRPS and make a difference. And they also wanted to ensure that recommended guidelines regarding early identification and treatment were being followed. So with the recognition that distal radius fracture is the most common um, predisposing injury, they sought to improve initial management pathways for this condition. How they did this was by introducing a comprehensive programme of patient information and also staff education regarding CRPS to help raise awareness and therefore staff and patients' ability to recognise the early warning signs of this condition and also to refer and begin early treatment um, so that we can and to reduce some of the associated risk factors. So some of the risk factors they identified were things like tight restrictive casts and therefore they developed a team culture of zero tolerance for tight restrictive or over flex casts. And another huge risk factor is immobility and pain and they promoted and encouraged early light function in a cast. So patients were required to still be able to make a fist even if they were in a cast and also to perform light function and exercises. By introducing this pathway, they found that the incidence in CRPS following a dorsal radius, sorry, distal radius fracture um, at their centre was 25% um, incidence pr prior to the introduction of the pathway. And after the introduction of the pathway, this dropped to less than 1%. So the figures here speak volumes and for me and Dr. Gobel working in chronic pain and dealing with the long term consequences of CRPS, this is such an important development in terms of treatment as it could really help prevent some of those later problems we see day in and day out and also treat. 
Writing up the audit, um, they looked at the evidence and found that there were very few other centres that had existing care pathways. And additionally, they found that evidence for the delay for delays in diagnosis and starting appropriate treatments with majority of patients reporting a median time between onset and diagnosis of six months. However, in clinical practice, we know actually this is a lot longer in many cases. So why were so few centres using care pathways and picking up this condition and managing it early? Well, several recent um, publications and surveys, including an international survey as well as UK-based surveys, surveys, have suggested that clinicians lack the confidence and the skills to recognise and to treat CRPS. So therefore, there's a big gap in the literature. We have guidelines recommending early detection and intervention, but few centres actually doing this. And there's also little research exploring the impact or efficacy of early treatment. So where there's a gap in the literature, it also represents an opportunity. However, knowing where to take this opportunity next was really difficult. And this is something where this is an area where mentorship was really important. Dr. Gobel was keen to support this project going forward and saw how valuable the work could be and suggested we work together to do so. Although it wasn't my idea, um, I was also keen to see this go further and be involved in the research. And Fiona and Sharon didn't have the same protected research time as me or Andreas to be able to take this forward on their own. So this is how our clinical team came about. As CRPS can be a chronic condition and we were keen to see if we can improve delivery, efficacy and equity of care, um, Dr. Gobel approached the um, person-centred complex care theme lead and arranged um, for him to meet us and discuss our ideas around the project. So we met with the lead and we discussed the, our ideas around the project. We highlighted the reasons why we felt this was really important in terms of care pathways and patient care and outcomes, and that we were really keen to take this forward and test whether it could be replicated elsewhere. He encouraged us to complete one of the ARC Northwest Coast Stage 1 Ideas scoping forms, which we did. And the form asks, and, um, asks for the outline questions. So therefore, in answer to the question, what is the problem? We outlined that the impact of CRPS in terms of cost, health inequalities um, and um, poor outcomes. In answer to question two, we outlined the discrepancy between what guidelines say and what happens in practice and that there's limited um, evidence that examines preventive, treat preventative treatment for CRPS or support um, implementation of treatment pathways. We had a clear target population of patients with um, distal radius fracture. And our project plan was to replicate the model of education and raising early awareness and recognition. We felt that this would need a mixed methods health system research model, but we really weren't confident in the best approach or method for this and what it would look like. We felt really strongly that clinic clinician willingness um, and drive um, would, would influence the ability to be able to successfully replicate the intervention. Um, and we felt it had the potential to reduce national service inequalities, patient outcomes and improve long term care. Um, in terms of support, we, we felt that we perhaps needed more support with um, mixed methods health system research, um, support from the impact team and their input and support in um, scoping exercise uh, as to what the cultural norms, barriers and facilitators across services would be to assist um, further funding application under the complex care theme. We also um, felt we needed help evaluating the potential social economic health inequalities, but also their benefits. After the, completing the application, we were invited to present the idea to the impact team. Um, and they discussed and suggested different research method options that we could consider. They also provided us with guidance um, on terms of areas of the project that we would perhaps need to work on, such as defining more clearly the intervention, um, really clearly defining what usual care was and how this would differ in different centres and how we could um, explore this. What we need, um, they also discussed what we needed to consider in terms of incidents and measurement, and they offered support and suggested a follow up meeting in order to build the project further. And this was really exciting for us um, as it looked like um, it was a real chance that this could happen and, and therefore made our drive even stronger. 
At future meetings, Impact invited other key people that would help develop and build the project further and team members to facilitate smaller project meetings to maintain progress and support. Um, they, they invited Lancashire Clinical Trials Unit Managers um, and they provided, um, are providing statistical support and support in terms of trial design and running. Um, Midas also provided um, expertise and support from health and health economics perspective and also with quantitative and mixed methods research. Um, one of the MIDAS team members is also a member of the Research Design Service Northwest and also um, provided methodological support on all types of grant applications. So it's been a fantastic opportunity to have access to all of this expertise within one team and to have the opportunity to learn what exp expertise we needed. One thing that has um, become really apparent through working with the team is the, the differences in languages of uh, clinicians and researchers. And, and some of these differences and discussions have led to a lot of questions um, that we as clinicians hadn't considered weren't clear from the offset um, and have helped us to um, work on answering those questions, uh, but also allowed the work to grow and identified the need to work on specific packages to address uncertainties and any potential risks to the project. It has been really, really helpful in helping us to reframe our idea and develop the project beyond just an idea and good intentions. Um, working with them has also helped us better define our idea and to shape it. We now not only have a name, but also a clearer research question. And the plan is to deliver an implementation project that replicates the previous model of care within the fracture clinics, but deliver that elsewhere in the UK with the aim of improving early detection and prevention of CRPS following distal radius fracture. Um, we will be using a mixed method design um, that will apply both qualitative and quantitative approaches um, and with different work packages um, to help answer this question. Once, our, uh, once we had a clear idea of what we'd like to be able to do, um, it was important to consider what funding stream we were aiming for. And there's lots of different funding streams. So which funding stream was the best for us? Uh, the advisor from Myodas and the Research Design Service Northwest helped to ensure um, it was within the scope of the programme grants for applied research, and it was a feasible project for this. And the support and expertise from the, the team and this member of staff has also helped to mould the project um, so that we can see it moving forward. Then we've had several more meetings, um, but progress was a little bit stunted, and we often felt like we were covering the same ground again. And one of the reasons for this um, and the problems identified was we weren't clear who was responsible for what. And this changed really um, in a meeting where we considered roles and responsibility. So who was doing what um, and who could drive things forward? As part of this, I um, took on the role of principal investigator with, with <laughs> be fair to say, with some uncertainty. Um, but we also considered all the expertise and what roles everybody would have um, within this project. So who who's going to be the named statistician, the named health economist, um, who would form the clinical team, um, consider what stakeholders we wanted involved, um, the need to strengthen the implementation science and who, uh, who would support this, as well as the qualitative re research expertise um, and developing um, the research design as well. Um, this is going to be really important in order to be if we are successful with funding, as we need to demonstrate that we've got the sufficient skills and expertise to deliver the project. Funders need to be confident in the team and they also need to know um, the team has a proven track record. Since then, we've had a few meetings and we've been more focused and considered specific aspects of the method and the application that need um, answering, such as sample size, barriers and facilitators, who to involve, what we need to justify, what are the strengths of the project, what do we need to highlight and really um, make, make a focal point. Um, thinking about patient and public involvement all the way through the project and defining the clinical impact and translatability. The project's become more defined with specific work packages falling into these broad themes. So exploration, preparation, implementation, feasibility testing and refining and event evaluation. 
We're proposing, as I've mentioned, a mixed method design, applying both qualitative and quantitative approaches with different work packages to help answer the question. But the initial work packages will help develop and test the intervention guided by an implementation framework, while the latter work packages would potentially use cross-sectional cluster controlled step wedge design to evaluate this package in other centres and allow us to collect outcomes before and after implementation. So where are we now and are we yet there yet? Well, not quite. We're working towards a grant submission, so we've definitely got a deadline in sight, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. We've been able, with support and expertise from the team, identify clearer packages of work. We've also been able to identify key components that are needed and what support we need to develop these. It's been a real opportunity to have the benefit of um, and the expertise of this team in identifying what we need to include um, and support with grant writing and considering what and why. It's really helped us to understand all aspects of the process and evaluation, not just we know it works and let's do it. So in terms of lessons learned, um, I think it wasn't clear to us when we first started what was out there. Um, and we also didn't have a clear understanding of the role of different agencies. However, I think this has grown with time. It would have helped with progress if we considered our potential roles at the start of the project and what we could provide. Um, and also understanding the different languages for clinical, um, for clinicians and research has at times been challenging, but it's allowed us to see that research does need us clinicians to ensure it has relevance to clinical practice and to ask the right questions. But we also need researchers to ensure research methods are effective and that we're asking the right questions and measuring effect the right way. And the team has really helped um, this evolve for us. So in terms of top tips, I think having a good idea is really important, but also a clear idea of what you hope your idea to achieve. Um, I think it's really important to be honest in what you know, but also really honest in what we don't know um, and asking for help and support in those areas because help is out there. And if we get help and support, make the most of the expertise being offered, the mentorship, the time, the advice, the feedback, the support and signposting is invaluable. And even if your bid isn't successful, there's a lot you can learn from this process. If it is successful and you um, get support and get assigned to the team, expect to rewrite and review it a lot. And you need a good amount of time to be able to commit to this and advancing it further forward. So I'd just like to thank everybody for listening. And my email address is at the bottom if anybody has any further questions. I'm Professor Nevin Williams from the Department of Primary Care and Mental Health in the University of Liverpool. We have won research funding from the National Institute of Health Research Health Technology Assessment Programme for this trial called ACTIVATE, which will be testing cardiac rehabilitation for people with long-term stable angina. We will be recruiting participants from the Northwest Coast region and also from North Wales and Leicester. What is angina pectoris? Angina is chest pain brought on by physical exertional stress and is caused by narrowed coronary, coronary arteries due to atherosclerosis, restricting blood flow to the cardiac muscle or myocardium. It can severely limit day-to-day -day activities. Current management consists of behavior change to stop smoking, improve diet, reduce weight and increase physical activity, drug treatments and revascularization procedures such as stents and coronary artery bypass graft operations. People are routinely referred to cardiac rehabilitation following one of these car revascularization procedures or following a myocardial infarction or heart attack. Cardiac rehabilitation programs promote the physical and mental health of people with heart disease by increasing their understanding of the disease and improving their physical fitness levels. There are seven core components in all cardiac rehabilitation programs which are health behavior change and education, lifestyle risk factor management, cardioprotective therapies, medical risk factor management, psychosocial health, long-term management, as well as audit and evaluation. Cardiac rehabilitation is known to be effective following myocardial infarction and revascularization procedures and is routinely offered to these patients. 
There is some limited evidence that is also effective for chronic stable angina, but insufficient evidence for the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, to recommend its routine use in the NHS. More evidence for its effectiveness and cost effectiveness is needed. In addition, most of the evidence is from white middle class men. Evidence is needed from the broader population. This is the um, intervention we, we will be testing in the trial. Activate Your Heart is an online, interactive, secure and password protected website designed for participants to use at home. The prog programme was co-produced with healthcare professionals, patients or members of the public and software designers. The programme aims to deliver all of the core components of cardiac rehabilitation and uses the following behaviour change techniques goal setting, self-monitoring, feedback on behaviour, graded tasks, social reward, providing information about health consequences and reducing negative emotions. The programme is tailored to individual need and is in four stages which can be completed in eight weeks but access to the site and its features continue for 12 months. Before beginning the programme, each participant sees a member of Cardiac Rehabilitation staff who provides face-to-face -face training on the website and a written user manual. In case of COVID-19 restrictions, this could be performed by remote telephone or video consultation. The participant will complete an online registration form which records their medical history and cardiac risk factors. The website generates a tailored plan from this information consisting of individualized tailored goals for exercise diet, such as eating more fruit and vegetables and reducing salt, emotions, such as managing stress, anxiety and low mood, and smoking. Adherence with these goals is regularly assessed by a short set of questions and feedback on performance. As the user progresses through the program, goals become increasingly difficult. Each user records details of their daily exercise in an online diary and regular, and regular feedback is given. Smokers are provided with feedback about the amount of money they are saving. The programme also contains written information about the health consequences of heart disease and risk factors such as exercise, diet, sexual activity, driving, returning to work, hobbies, holidays, benefits, smoking, anxiety and mood. In addition, the programme reduces negative emotions by providing advice about stress reduction and anxiety management skills. There is access to an online discussion forum and Ask the Expert email facility. Cardiac rehabilitation staff can monitor participants' progress and respond to questions posted via email. After 12 weeks, the cardiac rehabilitation staff member will see the participant again for a face-to-face -face consultation to discuss progress and local exercise opportunities. In case COVID-19 restrictions, restrictions persist, this could also be performed by a remote telephone video or video consultation. We will develop a paper-based alternative for people who cannot or are reluctant to use the website. We will recruit participants from about 20 GP practices with a total practice population of 172,650. 2% of practice populations will have angina, about 3,453, which will identify by read code search of the electronic medical records. They will be invited to participate by letter on practice headed paper signed by their GP. 15% of people with angina were recruited to a previous small randomised control trial, so we hope to recruit 518 participants. Participants will give informed consent to the baseline outcome assessment, followed by one-to-one -one remote web-based randomization to usual care or usual care plus the Activate Your Heart programme. Follow-up assessments will be performed in the GP practice at 6 and 12 months. We will test effectiveness of the programme with the following outcome measures. The physical limitation domain of the UK version of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire will be the primary outcome. Secondary outcomes include the other domains of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire, such as angina stability, angina frequency, treatment satisfaction and quality of life, the Rose Dyspnea Scale, Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, and generalised self-efficacy scale. 
Physical activity will be measured with the Active Pal accelerometer worn on the thigh for seven days and supplemented by the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. Physical fitness will be assessed using the incremental shuttle walk test. We will also test cost effectiveness in a concurrent economic evaluation using Euroqual to measure quality adjusted life years and we'll also measure um, health service costs. A concurrent process evaluation will build a picture of how the intervention was carried out in reality and what factors shaped it. Patient and public involvement has informed all stages of the Activate research application. We have two patient and public involvement co-applicants and a public advisory group meeting regularly during the setup phase of the trial. We aim to increase the membership of this group, particularly from ethnic minorities and from people who are reluctant or unable to use websites. We will also recruit two additional members to the Independent Trial Steering Committee from, the, from, from public patient and public involvement people. The public advisory group will continue to meet throughout the trial to advise on the trial delivery. It will also inform the dissemination of the trial findings, not just for scientific conferences and peer-reviewed publications, but also to the trial's participants, patient groups and charities. Most research, most research includes white middle-class men, women, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, people from socio-economically deprived areas are underrepresented. We have integrated health equity considerations into the Activate trial. Tools to help us reach these not traditionally engaged groups include the Health Inequalities Assessment Toolkit and also advice from the Centre for Black and Minority Ethnic Research in Leicester, who have advised us to record a short video explaining the trial which can be shared with local community groups. Our next, tasks, our next steps are to complete setup tasks including um, collaborator agreement, develop paper-based manual, um, also sponsorship application, then NHS Research Ethics Committee application. We'll identify GP practice sites and cardiac rehabilitation teams and engage with community groups. The trial start date is 1st of August this year and participant recruitment will start in December. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Adam Noble, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool. Using a case example, I've been asked to give a feel as to how one can pull an idea for applied research into a grant application. One approach to securing funding is you have an Archimedes-style Eureka moment. You personally come up with a polished idea from the start. You ask for funding, you get it, and then you do the study you envisage. This approach, I contend, like the great man view of history, is for most largely inaccurate. This, I would say, is more accurate. The project idea evolves as more and more people from both inside and outside the research team offer their expertise, guidance and insights to help ensure the work is actually addressing the problem at hand and is feasible. Other factors are also shaping the project idea. This includes negotiating the rock and hard place that is what funders want and when and what your organisation will support you with. The process is a thorough one and rightly so. It is finite public money we are typically seeking. The process is nevertheless testing. It requires many people's time, in some cases their time and generosity. It requires negotiation, creative thinking and an element of marketing. It is also important to recognise that only around 20% of applications that are made are successful. The example project I'd like to talk to you about is the RADOS application we recently made to NIHR. It involved members from several arts. It sought to address a national priority highlighted by the NHS long-term plan namely for the ambulance service to convey fewer people to hospital EDs when safe so as to reduce so-called avoidable attendances. Avoidable attendances are those where the person does not receive any test, assessment or intervention that actually required the facilities of a type 1 emergency department. They account for about one in five visits. Ambulance services have already rapidly evolved from a, rapid transport, from a previously largely rapid transportation service to one that now offers varied response options. However, the long-term plan wants more non-conveyance when it's safe. To achieve this, crews will require support. When ambulance clinicians are asked about what research to be focusing on, they say they need help to figure out who does and does not need to be conveyed. They report much uncertainty regarding their own assessments of, uh, for non-conveyance. They express concern for patient safety and their personal liability if an incorrect decision is made. 
and the person dies or experiences an adverse event at the non-conveyance. They say they do not know what happens to patients when they're taken to ED, that they're being asked to make decisions they're not on presentations they're not specialist in, and that all of this often leads to disproportionate risk aversion with patients being conveyed to ED uh, out of precaution. When the ambulance, sorry, when the NIHR released a call for research in urgent care, a group of us uh, met to discuss how to respond. The initial idea was to pick an exemplar condition that's prone to being over conveyed by the ambulance service and then generate a training package for that presentation for ambulance conditions that was led by specialists and then evaluate how much it changed non-conveyance rates. Specialists could talk about case examples and red flags and the circumstances under which conveyance and non-conveyance would be recommended. On reflection, and having consulted with frontline clinicians, the idea was dropped. We realised crews wouldn't have time to attend it. Crews were not seeing these cases every day, and so their knowledge would likely decay by the time they needed it. Applying static rules and guidance to real world cases was quite difficult. Um, applying the, or offering the training at scale would have been challenging given the size of the workforce. And also really what crews say they want is for a specialist to be with them somehow when needed. We thus changed tack. The notion of being able to tap into expertise when needed struck a chord with us. Our group has expertise in modeling risk and in translating specialist knowledge into tools for use by service users and non-specialists. Could we therefore develop something similar for ambulance crews that would allow them whilst on scene to plug in information about the patient and the circumstances and generate a personalized estimate of the likely risk to that person if they were not conveyed and the chances that if they were conveyed that they would clinically benefit from ED. It seemed theoretically and practically possible. We generated and circulated a revised project sketch. This was sent to a wider group of ambulance clinical leads and also service users. The idea chimed well and led us to submit the RADOS application. RADOS is a 36 month project application that asks for about half a million pounds. It is a project that proposes linking of care records to document the care that adults seen by different regional ambulance services get and their outcomes. It would clarify the short-term risks and benefits of conveyance and non-conveyance and determine if it's possible using structured and unstructured information recorded by clinicians when at scene to estimate a person's risks and benefits of non-conveyance. The tool will be developed using data from one regional service and then externally validated from, on services from other parts of the country. It would also see how it works inside and outside of pandemic periods. Risk prediction tools are scenario specific, so we decided to choose an exemplar condition to work with, namely seizures. This felt um, proportionate because we didn't really know whether the idea would definitely work. This is a representation of our journey in the timeline for our RADAS application. The NHR operates a two-stage process. Stage one comprises of an outline application. If you're shortlisted to stage two, you're asked to submit a more comprehensive application. Overall, the application process took us around 12 months. Having decided on the basis of initial feedback to develop a risk prediction model, we generated a draft project plan. We started to invite others as well to the team to ensure we had the breadth of experience and expertise. These people offered their reflections and helped refine the project idea further. The team ultimately includes 12 persons. Amongst them are persons with lived experience, ambulance clinicians, seizure specialists and researchers. We also sought the NHS sites at this stage. They needed to have the capability and capacity for the project. Having done this, we then conducted a more formalised stakeholder and deep, more formalised stakeholder engagement event. We generated one page summaries of the project for lay audiences, health professionals and data controllers. With the help of the British Epilepsy Association, we interviewed about 10 people of epilepsy and their family members and supporters who had had recent contact with the ambulance service. We did a similar thing with paramedics from seven of England's 10 ambulance services. We asked the groups to rate the importance of the project, what they liked about it and did not. Our project plan would have been nothing without the input of these people. It helped flag up additional work we needed to do, additional elements the project needed to build in. By July, five months later, we had a detailed project plan. Strictly speaking, this is more comprehensive than needed for a 12 page outline application. However, my experience is that it's easier to have considered the finer details and then distill things. I would note here that 65% of outline applications are not shortlisted by the NHR. Thus, investing time in the stage one application consideration elements is really important. We submitted our detailed protocol 
um, to peer review. Reviews are always a little tricky. One needs to develop a thick skin. Is there much better get these comments before submission and build on them? In August 2020, we submitted the form, formal costing requests to all the institutions involved. This took a month. The project needs to buy sufficient investigator and research time to do the project. It is, however, not the only consideration. One always needs to have an eye on the bottom line, as value for money is a key funder criteria. What I find helpful here is the NHS NHR library. One can search it for keywords to find projects funded by the NHR in the past that use similar methods or approaches to yours. It is time consuming, but it means you can determine some sort of benchmark as to what's acceptable to them, and you can account for inflation. September stage one application was submitted. In late December, we received notification of being shortlisted and we got comments from the board about changes they wanted us to build into our full application. The deadline for submission is six weeks later and this period crosses the festive one. A draft is uh, prepared after the teams met in the festive period. Um, we are also seeking revised costs at this stage. It's only minor tinkering, but it still takes four weeks. The final application uh, is submitted then. Final application consists of a 50 page uh, document and a 20 page detailed project description. Two to three weeks later, we get comments from five reviewers and are asked to respond to them in about a week. The reviews, our application and our response to the reviews are part of the submissions considered by the funding panel. We we'll wait to hear the outcome of the application and likely that is next week. So key points. The approach I've described here has been largely successful. There is no single right way. There are other ways and others will, uh, will endorse other approaches. This is the other one that I've taken. It's clear that whatever approach one does take though, the whole process of application is a testing one and one needs to go in, into it with the eyes wide open. It is though incredibly rewarding um, to get the funding and to do these projects and to really make a difference. One really needs the views of people from multiple disciplines and people with lived experience of the, the topic you're addressing to ensure that your project is convincing and is really going to make a difference. Funding panels are made up of experienced experts and people with lived experience, and they can readily see through paper thin cases and arguments. It is all a team effort, but we still need to recognize that someone is needed to drive these projects forward and these applications forward and also deal with the often unsociable deadlines. I hope that application was helpful. Hello, um, I'm Lauren Walker. I'm senior lecturer in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics, and I support the multimorbidity theme uh, within person-centered complex care. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about a comprehensive research framework for multimorbidity. And just some thoughts that I've gathered over time through discussing the different um, researchers who are involved in the um, in understanding multimorbidity both here and across the UK and also taking a, a kind of polypharmacy um, view and lens on that as a, as a clinical pharmacologist um, you know my my interest is is both in the disease acquisition but also in the way that medicines co accumulate over time in, in people with multimorbidity. So we hear a lot about the definition of, of multimorbidity, this coexistence of two or more long term conditions occurring within an individual. And we know that that covers a whole, you know, a really broad gambit, really, uh, when you consider both physical and mental health disorders. So there's, that's led to a newer um, definition of, uh, that includes complex multimorbidity, which is three or more conditions affecting three or more organ systems, which reflects a bit more of the reality, really, for people who have uh, who are under the care of uh, multiple different organ-based specialists. And we recognise increasingly that there is a need to move away from the traditional reductionist approach to healthcare organisation. And by that, I mean the individual organ-based specialty services that are that lead to individual organ based prescribing where super specialization um, has has led to uh, people who are very comfortable within their own prescribing area but have less knowledge of the prescribing that occurs in other diseases so take for example cardiology it's very common now for people to either super specialize within electrophysiology or interventional cardiology and that's true for many other organ based special specialties and although for older patients, they may be able to access generalised 
uh, generalist secondary care in the form of uh, gerontologists, no such service exists for younger people under the age of 65. And therefore the care, coordination of the care across different organ-based specialists falls um, to, to the general practitioner. And, and that's incredibly challenging when you begin to look at people who have three or more conditions affecting three or more organ systems. It's very difficult to keep a grip on um, what's happening across the care from all those individuals when they're spending a lot of time in and out of secondary care. So the NHS five year forward view focuses a lot on better care for people with long term conditions. And there is a lot of guidance um, from from NICE uh, that forms part of the UK's quality and outcomes framework within the GP contract, um, where in the latest version that includes 19 different diseases um, or 19 uh, disease register indicators. Uh, so all those individual conditions often require an annual review and follow up. So if we have a look at that in more detail, what you can see on this uh, in this table is that these conditions, um, many of them are what we would call concordant multimorbidity. They share common etiological factors. We know um, clinically that they're very likely to co-occur. So things like um, atrial fibrillation and coronary heart disease and um, heart failure, they, they will share kind of common goals of care. What's less well understood and therefore more difficult often to manage, uh, certainly pharmacologically, are those discordant disease clusters. So things like severe mental illness, uh, things like schizophrenia, where having, you know, we know that people with severe mental illness are more likely to develop multimorbidity and indeed ha have premature cardiovascular death than the general population. But, but there is no obvious mechanistic, a shared mechanistic pathway between something like schizophrenia and something like um, coronary heart disease, for example. And, but actually, it's it's more complicated than that because a lot of it lies within the, you know, the, the risks um, and, and again, with the medicines, really. So one way that we can begin to look at how diseases, how you might take those individual diseases in that table and look at how they co-accumulate over time and how they're interlinked or cluster together is to take existing health records. And you can do that by looking at uh, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, which contains the electronic healthcare records for about 4 million people across the UK. Um, so where GP practices are contributing their coded data and, and one of the you know one of the benefits for that is that we can begin to see using disease codes uh, what what are the diseases that have co-accumulate um, to start to begin to understand the patterns and we've been doing some of that work in collaboration with um, colleagues in uh, computer sciences uh, where we look at what are the diseases that co-accumulate um, and and if you add timestamps to those codes can you begin to see how that happens over time and so what we found was that there are some diseases that are particularly prevalent within the data set um, that, that kind of jump out at you. So chronic pain, very, very common based on the prescribing data, hypertension, diabetes. And this is a million people over the age of 50. So these are the kinds of diseases that we might expect. But what becomes immediately obvious is that chronic pain doesn't fit nicely into a cardiovascular sub group of multimorbidity or into a you know a gastroenterological uh, or gastrointestinal subgroup of multimorbidity that it's really hard to know where to fit that and that's true as well for if you if you consider mental health disorders it can become and and what we need to avoid is them is those disorders that have a heavy burden for patients being sidelined and um, because they don't fit nicely into an organ-based system so this is a bit of a busy slide, but it represents some of the work we've been doing and what you might envisage being able to do in the future through a machine learning approach. If we can collaborate better with our colleagues in, in health data sciences and begin to understand each other's language, because that's, a, you know, some being a major barrier to date that this, you know, dealing with big data requires very different skills to the, to the traditional um, and our clinical skills that, that, that we have as physicians. So if we look at this, um, this image uh, on the left here, what you can begin to build by putting timestamps on data and looking back, say, 10 years within CPRD and following patients forward from the antecedent event, the, the first time they acquire their second long term condition, following those codes um, and to see what other diseases they accumulate, you can begin to do deep dives into individual conditions. So if you if you have a look there in that net interactive network analysis, you can see the blue spot in the middle with lots of arrowheads pointing towards it so that's hypertension um, and, and so very commonly occurring diseases will often have um, as an antecedent which means it happens first
first, a lot of the consequent diseases, those that occur secondary to it, you can see multiple arrowheads because hypertension increases your risk of multiple different long term conditions. So that begins to make sense. But you can also start to look at the discordant diseases. Those are on the outer edge of that, of that network analysis where you can start to see the things that perhaps happen less commonly, but when they do happen, they are absolutely always followed by the next disease. So those predictable relationships. And so what you can see on the right side of the image is that if you take something like chronic pain as an antecedent, you look at those people who, who acquired chronic pain quite early on in their disease course, we can see that that's quite commonly followed after four or five years by hypertension and that ultimately by chronic kidney disease. And then some of the complexities become obvious because when we did that deep dive into chronic pain and you look at the, the prescriptions for those individuals, more than a third were taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs regularly, so more than four times a year for multiple years. And we know that NSAIDs are associated with both leading to hypertension but exacerbating existing hypertension and that they are also implicated in the disease etiology for chronic kidney disease. Um, as is hypertension. So it becomes a, a kind of that you start to see that complexity of how uh, and what you can start to look at is if you divide people by the class of medicines that they're prescribed, can you see um, does the time to disease two or disease three or disease four shorten because of the, the influence of the medicines that they're taking. And it's complex and it's difficult to, there are many, many other factors that are implicated, but it starts to show us how we might consider the way that we could reorganize services to better meet the needs of the population. So to, to summarize really, um, the study of patients' with multimorbidity has to go beyond the kind of well-defined disease labels that we have. And that's an important limitation that we have to acknowledge within existing data sets, that we're very good at coding for diseases. And we're very good as clinicians at looking for the diseases we know will co-occur alongside diabetes, for instance. I'm going to start looking for hypertension and hyperlipidemia because I know that there's, those are risk factors, along with diabetes for later onset um, cardiovascular disease, for example. And therefore, those those patterns will emerge when you when you do this sort of thing within an existing data set, but they're health related behaviours because we're looking for them. Whereas if somebody's diagnosed with chronic pain, there are no particular individual diseases that I will go hunting for because I didn't didn't recognise until now that that was a very common antecedent or start you know, disease in the multimorbid pathway. And one opportunity that machine learning approaches offer for us is the ability to objectively identify patterns within existing data sets without putting, you know, without it being influenced by what we expect to find. But the really important thing is that we have to start thinking about how we capture the variables that negatively affect, negatively affect the quality of life of people living with multimorbidity. And that's really important. Where we're good at the putting disease labels on things, we're less good at identifying within data sets things like cognitive impairment and incontinence and falls and dizziness. And if we get, and, and those, are, you know, what is frailty considered a long term condition? Is delirium, if it happens recurrently, considered a long term condition? And, and we don't capture those things very well in traditional, you know, coded data sets. So we need to involve patients at an early stage to identify what are the things that matter most? What are the outcome variables that we should be looking at? trying to prevent for those individuals, rather than just thinking about, you've got this disease and I want to prevent that disease. Um, because, because it is much more complicated than that. And that that complexity increases when we then start to factor in the medicines as well, and the potential for problematic polypharmacy that can shorten the time interval between one disease and another. And in order to take that forward really, I strongly believe that we need a closer collaboration between medical experts, those working in public health and, and early intervention and between data scientists. And we need to get better at speaking each other's language. And there are funders that are interested in this. You know, the, the NIHR recent AIM scheme, Artificial Intelligence in Multimorbidity. There's been an MRC scheme aimed at multimorbidity as well. But beyond that, the research for patient benefit side, um, you know, for the NIHR calls, thinking about if we are looking at outcome, uh, defining outcome variables that are relevant to patients, coding for things like walking difficulty within um, existing data sets so we can find, you know, at what point does that start to occur within the pattern of multimorbidity. And so those new, you know, relationships offer us opportunities that we perhaps haven't 
recognized before to allow us to do what, it, what I, you know, I do believe it's essential that we have a better definition of multimorbidity that includes smaller subgroups, smaller phenotypic subgroups, but we must try to avoid putting people in disease or organ based silos, that it's got to be a much more objective approach than that. And, you know, one way to do that is if you take the example of natural language processing of existing healthcare records, there's a lot of data and a lot of information that is relevant to patients that is contained within clinic letters and mental health care records and psychological assessments where behavioural and social risk factors for disease are quite well captured, but that, that information becomes lost because those clinic letters are scanned in to uh, an electronic healthcare record service and they're available for the GP to view among you know the myriad other clinical information that they are regularly sent but when it comes to coding they they are lost um so so it is possible to to find that to you know mine large volumes of text and, and extrapolate that and integrating the you know data sets is also really important linking primary and secondary care and social care data and mental health care records to give us a more complete and holistic view of the individual should hopefully allow us to identify common mechanistic pathways that link diseases within a cluster beyond the traditional etiological things that we're already aware of if you can find, you know, if you take an example of inflammation or a particular inflammatory pathway, if you can identify something that links three discordant diseases together, then, then the future of therapeutics is to design drugs that hit more than one disease with an individual treatment strategy. And that really is the future. If you want to target problematic polypharmacy and reduce the pill burden for individuals, which is, which is really important. And that was all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Great. So we've had a really interesting uh, mixture of talks. I hope you've uh, really enjoyed that. I I, I did, uh, and, and uh, uh, it really gives you gives you a flavour of um, um, uh, how how projects uh, start with an idea, how those ideas get moulded and uh, uh, and things evolve. And uh, I'm aware that we've got two or three minutes which might prove quite challenging to uh, conduct uh, some some discussion I, I don't see any specific questions in in the in the chat but, but we, we started off with um, uh, uh, I guess Alan and Seth talking about uh, uh, introducing themselves and, and, and discussing the uh, kind of the public engagement and, and Selena uh, I don't know whether you want to uh, comment a bit, a bit further on the, the public engagement uh, work in the uh, CRPS uh, project, and, and there was a there was a bit of a comment on, on on the chat as well. I'm not sure everyone will have seen that. Yeah, Paula asked what um, patient and public about, um, engagement we have at the moment. Um, We've had, we, we run at the Walton Centre patient education, well, patient days for CRPS each year, which are attend, really well attended. They started with about 50 patients and I think we're well in excess of about 150 patients each year now. And they're attended by patients and carers. So those meetings have really validated some of the themes that we wanted to bring out in this project and they've um, a big thing that comes up is that they wish they'd been diagnosed earlier there's a really strong belief that their outcome their life would be better had treatment started earlier um, and they really want clinicians to be aware um, of CRPS and report a lot of frustrations that people don't know too much about it so that ties in sort of with our um, our project and then as part of the project um, in the early stages in the qualitative interviews we want to do to um, explore um, barriers and enablers. One of the focus groups we want to do is with patients as well, as well as clinicians, and hopefully patients from those groups can be part of our implementation strategy group that will review any themes and help to refine the project um, and identify the relevant behavioural change techniques that we'll need to put in to adjust the existing project a little bit more. We also would like to invite some members um, from the, the focus groups to become part of an outcomes group as well, because um, we want outcomes to measure behavioural change, but we also want some practitioner-based outcomes, but also 
patient related health outcomes as well um, are going to be really important so they can help define those and also to be part of a stakeholder group that then when we define the implementation can say whether they think it's valid and then when we feasibility test it look at the results of that and see what else needs refining before we go for the efficacy um, testing the efficacy really so really just involving patients and public all the way through because they're the ones this is going to benefit really and they can really help shape and define this project and make sure it, it, it means not just something for clinicians, but it's going to make valid changes. Thanks, uh, thanks, Selena. And I think that takes us to half eleven. I think we're due to due to close now. Um, again, I thought that was a great session. I hope uh, you've you, you've learned a lot about how how projects might go from idea to application, and and we're going to continue working on on the stuff that we've prioritised over the past few months and. Uh, already looking forward to the next art fest so enjoy your coffee and comfort break and see you at the next session thanks everyone